Oh, and the motion that this house would rather believe in a god. Speaking first on side proposition is Mark Dooley. Mark is an Irish philosopher, writer, and newspaper columnist, a specialist in con and continental philosophy, theology, and the philosophy of religion. He's the author of several books, including Conversation with Roger Scruton and Why Be a Catholic. Friedrich Nietzsche famously declared that God is dead. Unable to live with the consequences of that, he died a couple of years later of insanity. And the purpose of declaring, while he was still saying that God was dead, was to exalt humanity. That is what he called the Ubermensch, or the Overman. That we would triumph over this weak situation in which we had uh, enslaved ourselves, what he called the slave mentality of religion. The reality is that in religion, he said, humanity is debased. We are debased slave creatures, bovine mediocrity, as he called us. In fact, we are clever animals. He believed that we are clever animals. And it was our purpose to rise above the status of the bovine mediocrity to become this clever animal. The world is shaped the world that was shaped in the image of the human form divine, as William Blake called it, is, is now, for Nietzsche, a mechanical world of forces, where human beings are liberated from believing in anything but themselves. The opposition will undoubtedly try to seek, or seek to convince you, that this is what you are, all of you, clever animals, destined solely for the corruption of the grave. And I think deep down few of us are comfortable with that definition of ourselves, however trendy it might seem to us in our student union moments. But even if we become comfortable with it, we still unconsciously rely on the categories that animate the lives of believers, all of us, including them. Believers hold that we are not simply objects in a world of objects, but that we are a composite of subject and object. That is, we are both determined and yet free. They do not deny that our physical bodies have evolved, but this does nothing to undermine the fact that we are also persons, centres, that is, of moral reasoning. The fact that our world has been depersonalised, that many human beings reduce each other to the level of their animal components, does nothing to refute the fact of personhood. Yes, like animals, we are conscious, we have desires and instincts, but unlike them, we are self-conscious. We stand back from our immediate situation, resist instinct and control our desires, or at least some of us do. We can even ask the question of being, whether it is better to be or not to be. And in our most noble moments, we sacrifice for others. And that is why at the heart of the Christian religion is the heroic sacrifice of the cross, a sacrifice that believers are called upon to emulate every day of their lives. We look at each other and we do not see mere flesh. Although in our contemporary culture, flesh often seems to eclipse what animates it. And what does it animate? A believer would say spirit or soul. The philosopher would say subjectivity or the self. When I say I, or when you say you, when I refer to you as you, I'm not addressing the flesh only, the body or the, the determined elements of the human condition. I'm addressing a free being that is both incarnate in the flesh, but also a being that transcends it. From this, is the es from this flows the essence of human love. What you love in the other is not simply his or her flesh or body, but more, important, the, more importantly, the person that illuminates it. No one falls in love with a body solely, because you can always substitute one body for another, but you can't substitute one person for another. Put another way, when you look at a person, you encounter a locus of meaning, the why of creation. Now, of course, you cannot touch the subjectivity or the personhood of another, but to deny it is to deny the reality of that individual. Dissect the body and you won't lay hold of it, but yet it is the fundamental feature of every human being. You can give a scientific or natural explanation of the human being, of the human flesh, but to leave it at that would be to miss the most essential thing about us. It would be like looking at your wife's, wife's mouth the way a dentist looks at it and never looking at her smile. It would be like looking at the material structure of a painting and being blind to the image at its core. It would be like reducing a Mozart symphony to its technical aspect, thus missing its meaning for your life. Now, you might say that we should see human beings solely from the natural perspective, but who really does? Who really cuts nature at the joints like that? The scientist, the skeptic, the atheist, the materialist, all affect 
the naturalistic posture in their professional or public moments. But when they return home or in their private moments, do they really see their loved ones exclusively from that perspective? Don't they also overreach the empirical world when loving and honouring and sacrificing? Surely they too see their loved ones as some centres of subjectivity that pierce the fabric of the material world to offer an intimation of eternity or infinity. If they don't, well, let's not go there. Ours is only a world of causes and explanation. Not only of causes and explanations, but of meaning and of value. And when we discover meaning in the smile of a child, in the love of those to whom we commit our lives, and in those life-changing moments which we encounter through religion, art or philosophy, we realise that there is something much more to the human condition than is dreamt of in the book of evolution or in Nietzsche's mad ravings. And that is what believers see in every aspect of experience. They see the world not as a material entity, for then it is easy to abuse. No, they see it as a gift of creation, as something which smiles back to us with an almost human face, with a subjectivity of its own, and thus believers are the best, uh, are, are, are the best conservationists. Believers do not merely look at things, but they look deep into them. They perceive matter as only one half of the picture, the muscles, the bone and teeth, whose meaning is revealed in a smile. Their world is not reducible to its causal or animal essentials, but offers a revelation of the sacred. Opponents may deny what believers believe, but to do so is to deny what makes us truly human and to seal up those openings in our world through which ultimate meaning manifests. Of course, you can live like that if you wish, but to do so is to be only half alive to the wonder of what and who you are. And that is why I urge you now to support the motion that this house would rather believe. Onside opposition, speaking first is Michael Nugent. Michael is a writer and activist. He has written or contributed to seven books and has campaigned on many political issues, most notably challenging the Irish blasphemy law. Michael is also the chairperson of the, adv uh, the advocacy group Atheist Ireland. And I, I assume tonight when we're saying this house would rather believe, we're talking about one type of belief which is faith. Because people can believe things proportionately to the best available evidence which is a reasonable thing to do. And then people can use faith, which is belief that is disproportionate to the currently best available evidence. And I would suggest that faith in that context corrupts our sense of reality and it corrupts our sense of morality. So I read recently about a guy with a, a, a spinal injury who had surgery, best available surgery. surgery. And then he, um, after he was recovering from the surgery, he prayed to Casper uh, the Friendly Ghost to help him and he was able to walk again and you obviously realise that's a ridiculous story. But a representative of this secular university was in Rome last week to celebrate exactly the same story apart from it was Cardinal Newman or the Casper the Friendly Ghost who supposedly healed somebody after the person had had surgery. And the reason that some people believe that is that faith corrupts our sense of reality. Because we normally believe that things are true based on applying reason to the best available evidence. And as the claims become more unlikely, we raise the level of evidence that we need to satisfy ourselves that it's true. But with faith, we do the exact opposite. As the claims become more unlikely, we reduce the level of evidence that we are happy to, to take in order to believe it. And it encourages us to believe not only implausible claims, but to to believe in literally untestable claims. And then on top of that, uh, some people will say that we must live our lives on the basis of these untestable claims. And that brings us on to the second reason that faith is harmful and something that we should not rely on, is that it corrupts our sense of morality. Because morality is a natural function of our brains. It's because we are social animals and because cooperation is as essential as competition to the survival of species that morality has evolved. And in recent generations, and, and as humans have, a, have evolved a sense of reason, we have uh, increasingly come to respect things like individual conscience, um, personal rights, and, and the rights of non-human animals as well, which is something that I think is very important uh, uh, as, as a vegan. Now, it's already hard enough to figure out what the best thing to do morally in, a, in any circumstance. 
Because there's so many different permutations, so many interacting possibilities of the consequences of your decisions. But what religion and faith do is they corrupt that already difficult task by adding in supernatural elements, or supposedly supernatural elements, that, that are nothing to do with, with cooperation or reciprocity or fairness or empathy or compassion or the things that actually make up morality. And, and religious faith insists that our natural morality is trumped by what some people believe that the creator of the universe is telling us to impose on other peoples. And so you'll get things like, like many um, Catholics justifying denying condoms to AIDS victims in Africa, and many Muslims justifying that a man can beat his wife in certain circumstances. Not only is religion and religious faith not <coughs> needed for morality, it actually corrupts our sense of morality. And you can see that in passages uh, of, of the Bible, the, the most, or the Bible or the Quran. Probably the most relevant is in the Quran, where, where, where you're told to flog adulterers several hundred times, and the very next line is, do not let your compassion stop you. So they recognised, even while they were writing that, that they had to add an extra command from the supposed creator of the universe, because people would instinctively know by their compassion that this is not a moral thing to do. So the only reason I would suggest, the only valid reason that, that you might want to believe in uh, unreliable supernatural claims is if it makes life better. That might be a reason. It's not one that I would be happy with, but it might be a reason for some people. But the evidence suggests that it isn't. There's a group called the World Value Survey, which is a team of interdisciplinary social scientists around the world, and they've been mapping human values around the world for the last few decades. And what they have found is that when individuals are focusing on survival values, then societies have traditional religious values. And as individuals move away from survival values and towards secular rational values, which is triggered by things like investment in health, education, communications technology, move towards democracy, more of a sense of, of at least self-perceived control of your own life, that as individuals move in that direction, then societies move away from traditional religious values and towards secular rational values. In general, secular rational societies, that's the World Values Survey's term rather than mine, they have lower rates of a lot of the social outcomes that religion, religious people think they protect us from. They have lower homicide rates, juvenile and early adult mortality, STD infection rates, teen pregnancy rates, abortion rates. They're all lower in secular countries. And if you look at America, they're lower in the secular states than they are in the Bible Belt states. There are studies by social scientist Phil Zuckerman and others that have shown that secularists are, generally speaking, less nationalistic, less prejudiced, less racist, less sexist, less homophobic, uh, less nationalist, less dogmatic, less ethnocentric, and more tolerant. So I, I think even the hypothetical that it might be a good idea to believe something because it's useful isn't even the case. Religion corrupts our sense of reality, our sense of morality, and secularism brings better social outcomes. I want to finally touch on one of the points that, that, that uh, Mark made about, about consciousness. I agree we don't understand how consciousness works. There's several things that science hasn't figured out, several big things. We don't know how consciousness works. We don't know what happened before the Big Bang, or indeed if before the Big Bang makes any sense as a concept. We don't know how life began on Earth. We know how, how it evolved since it did begin. But there is a constant one-way traffic of previously religious explanations being overtaken by scientific explanations. Everything from people believing that, that, that mentally ill people are possessed by demons or the, the thunder was God's being angry. There's a constant flow in one way direction of religious explanations being overtaken by scientific explanations. So I think it's reasonable to assume as a default position until we find out more that when we do find out the answers to those questions that there are more likely to be natural answers rather than supernatural answers. Thank you very much. Speaking second on side proposition is Dr. Sylvia Panizza. Sylvia is a teaching fellow in ethics at the School of Philosophy, UCD. She previously worked as lecturer in ethics at the Norwich Medical School, University of East Anglia. Her research focuses on meta-ethics and animal ethics, and she's interested in secular approaches to mysticism. I want to focus on three terms, belief, transcendence, and absolute goodness. The last two are the closest that I can move to a conception of God. Other things maybe and typically are added to it, but most ideas of God, that I'm aware of at least, have this common ground, transcendent, absolute goodness.
goodness. But I want to start with the concept of belief. Belief has a large relationship with another concept, that of knowledge, in that we either take them to be opposed, either we believe all we know, and belief becomes a mere leap without justification. Or we take belief as following justification by amounting to knowledge if clear prior evidence for the belief can be found. But what sort of evidence are we talking about? In the space prior to any belief, prior to any stance towards the world, even the concept of evidence loses its meaning. What is to count as evidence? It depends on what matters to you, on what conception of reality you hold. There is no empty space for us to inhabit. A deterministic or a materialistic worldview is a metaphysical space of belief of some sort. And view of the world supported by absolute transcendent goodness is another. That's why Saint Anselm was right when he said, credo ut intelligum, I believe so that I may understand. Without belief, knowledge and understanding make no sense, literally. And this is an ordinary fact of life, before we even talk about spirituality. If I don't believe in my friend, I will not be able to see that her clumsy actions are an attempt to help me. If I don't approach a new city with hope and love, I will be blind to its hidden beauty. So what about transcendence and absolute goodness? My extremely pared down definition of a god. Well, we can live in a world where things matter or where they don't. We can live in a world where our actions matter or where they don't. The world in which they don't is a world of depression. The lights are out. Most of us, thankfully, do not live in that world. We think that somehow our decisions matter. But for them to matter, what they are about has to matter. If they were guided by self alone, we might as well throw dice. And when we do good, we feel that our lives too acquire meaning because we are moved in that direction. Now think of your experience of being kind, of helping others, or campaigning for a cause, defending an animal, anything you've done that is good, and see if this applies. That means that meaning is neither in us alone, or in the object that we're moving towards, but in something that holds us both together, us and that object. It both unifies us and transcends us. Without that, any decision would be inexplicable. Its value is absolute, because in order to give my action and my life meaning, the object that I'm moving towards must be good in itself. And I must desire it, whether it's me or somebody else that is furthering its end. I think that most of us live in this world that I've just pictured. One that shows that if we act at all, if we care at all, then we also believe. It's not just that absolute value must be present in some cases more than in others. It's not that at all. It's that we can place ourselves in the position to see it or to turn away. Like with any ordinary experience, we can look attentively this way or turn around. And it's not helpful to start the debate, as it's sometimes done, by looking the other way, forgetting that we have turned the other way, and then saying that there's nothing there. Thank you. Speaking second in opposition is John Hamill. John is a former member of the board at Atheist Alliance International and at Atheist Ireland. He now continues to campaign on secular issues as a contributor to the, three, to the Free Thought Pro uh, Profit Pro uh, podcast, which is based in the USA. So, uh, I would like to oppose the motion this evening, and I would like to oppose the motion on the basis that a belief in God reliably causes harm to people in our society. Now, the only way that we can ensure we achieve the best outcomes for everyone in society is that if we have an accurate understanding of how the world works. And the reliable way to understand how the world works 
is to form our beliefs around the best available evidence. Now, what I hope to convince you is that what a belief in God does is that it tends to allow people to reject the best available evidence and instead form their beliefs typically around words that happen to be scrawled on some ancient scroll or other from thousands of years ago. Now, I'm not arguing that all religious people only believe what happens to be in their special book. And I'm not arguing that all religious people are unable to appreciate evidence. But what I am arguing is that even when there's very compelling contemporary evidence available, what a belief in God does is it privileges really bad ideas from ancient books instead, and that inevitably causes harm. So Michael has talked about some of that in uh, principle. Maybe I can give you a quick example from my own personal experience and how this works. So I have a friend who's a Roman Catholic theologian, and we were talking about purgatory. For anyone here who doesn't understand the Catholic teaching on purgatory, this says that even the most devout and pious Roman Catholic will have committed some sins in their life, and therefore God will roast them in the fires of purgatory for a while before they're allowed into heaven. The more sins you commit here on earth, the longer you spend roasting in the fires of purgatory before you're allowed into heaven. Now, the caveat is that we're also told that God gives the Catholic Church the ability to award indulgences to the faithful, which implies that you get out of purgatory early. So this is early release into heaven. So for example, in 2016, Archbishop Michael Neary built a magic door at the Knox Shrine in County Mayo. He invited the faithful to come to his magic door and he promised anyone who walks through the magic door will get an indulgence from purgatory. And presumably when you collect your indulgence, you exit through the gift shop. So <clears throat> I asked my uh, theologian friend, surely you don't believe this. Surely you don't believe this man, Mr. Neary, has the power to move souls from purgatory and heaven based on who walks through his magic door. And what he explained to me was actually Roman Catholics have updated their beliefs about indulgences and purgatory. And so they no longer uh, believe the same things that they used to. And you might wonder uh, how this was done. So in 1967, there was something called Indulgentarium Doctrina. And that might sound like something concocted by a man in Hogwarts with a pointy hat and a long robe, but Indulgentarium Doctrina was concocted by a man with a pointy hat and a long robe in the Vatican. I encourage you to look it up. What it says is that in 1967, the Vatican decided that bishops can no longer give indulgences that are measured in days. Before 1967, you might have an indulgence for 10 days, 20 days, 50 days of purgatory, but after that date, you could no longer get an indulgence measured in days. So what evidence changed the mind of the Catholic Church? As my friend explained, in 1633, the Inquisition imprisoned Galileo for saying that the earth orbits the sun. At the time, that was a heresy because the church believed that the earth must always be static and a day was just defined as the amount of time it takes for the sun to traverse the sky. So some day after that, of course, the church accepted some new evidence and realized that a day is actually defined as the time taken for the earth to rotate once on its axis. And maybe you can see the problem. If that's how we define a day, and we are giving out indulgences for days out of purgatory, then that implies purgatory is on a planet that rotates at the same speed as planet Earth. So this was too silly even for the Catholic Church to teach. So in 1967, they changed their mind. You can no longer give out indulgences measured in days. But of course, Bishop Neary can still build a magic door in rural County Mayo which allows people to get time off purgatory and into heaven early. And I hope you can see that as an example of a case where even when there's very compelling contemporary evidence available, the belief in God has the effect of privileging ahead of that some ancient writings in a magic book. And this is a reliable way to be wrong about how the world work works. But it's a reliable way to be wrong about work, how the world works in ways that harm real people every day. So the same magic book 
that tells Bishop Neary to build a magic door in rural <laughs> County Mayo, also tells people that God wants to discriminate against women and gay people. So the Catholic Church that will tell us, well, we're all standing here today. There's an invisible sky carpenter who's looking down on you all now. This is an all-powerful God, an all-knowing God. This is a God that creates the entire universe, but he also gets really very upset if a woman wants to be a priest or a gay couple want to get married. Now, I hope I don't have to explain the absolutely appalling harms that have been caused in this country over many generations by the idea that God wants us to discriminate against women and gay people. And I think this is just one example of um, where privileging uh, ancient beliefs from magic books has real harm in the world. So that's why I'm opposing the motion and I hope you'll enjoy me uh, in opposing the motion because a belief in God tends to lead us to have incorrect views about how the world works and those errors cause real harms for real people in society. Thanks. The third and final proposition speaker is Peter van der Burt. Peter has been a senior lecturer in experimental physics at NUI, at NUI Maynooth since 1993 and is also the chairperson of Christians in Science Ireland. I want to start by thanking the UCD Law Society for inviting me to this very interesting debate. And of course, I will then support the proposition this House would rather believe in a God. And because of my background in physics and my personal interest in science and Christianity, I will approach this statement of tonight by asking whether it's reasonable to believe in God, whether science has proved or disproved the existence of God, and what point is there in natural science towards God? And I want to start here, and I think in the context of what has been said already, can we do away with, with belief purely on the basis of reason? This is a statement of the, of the well-known Christian author C.S. Lewis in his book of Miracles, where he states, but it becomes clear that you cannot find out by reasoning whether the cat is in the linen cupboard, it is reason herself who whispers, go and look. This is not my job, it is a matter of the senses. And indeed, there is Francis Collins, who is the former director of the Human Genome Project in the United States, who has written a book called The Language of God. And in that book, he states, we may, may well discover from science many interesting answers to the question, how does life work? But we cannot discover through science alone are the answers to the questions, why is there life anyway? And why am I here? And anyone who would like to think that belief and reasons are incompatible, should look at the list of Christians in science and technology on Wikipedia. And on that page it's stated, it's, it's too long a list for me to uh, reiterate here, overall Christians have won a total of 72.5% of all the Nobel Prizes in chemistry, 65.3% in physics, 62% in medicine, and 54% in economics. God is not some kind of a superhuman being or spirit worshipped as having power over nature or human fortunes or a figment of our imagination. According to Christianity, God is the creator and ruler of the universe and the source of all moral authority. And indeed, in James Sire, it gives a lengthy discussion about the attributes of the Christian God, where he says that God is infinite, personal, transcendent, imminent, omniscient, sovereign, and good. In my view, to get into the science, it's extremely difficult to rigorously prove the existence of God from first principles based on scientific observation. That just simply doesn't work. But I also think the opposite is true. It's not possible to rigorously prove the non-existence of God based on scientific observations. But merely referring to scientific observations and to say, okay, we can't observe God, so therefore God mustn't exist, that is a conclusion that we cannot draw. But if we cannot find vigorous proof or disproof of the existence of God, are there indicators within natural science that nevertheless point us towards the existence of God? And I think that there are two main topics that I can briefly pinpoint. That is the, what's known as the fine-tuning of the fundamental constant, and that it is the complexity and in information in biological organisms. The Fine-tuning of the fundamental constants. The fundamental constants in physics and cosmology are constants that describe the strengths of the interactions 
uh, of the forces in nature, the cosmological constants that deal with the properties and expansion of the universe, and the dimensions of space and time. And fine-tuning says that the values of the fundamental constants are such that, if they differed even slightly from their actual values, life as it presently understood could not possibly have arisen in the universe. And fine-tuning is widely accepted and is covered by an extensive literature. Now, there are three basically meaningful explanations of fine-tuning. The first explanation is that there should be a theory of everything that we haven't discovered yet, but this theory of everything that would then explain why the universe is that it is. A second explanation is that there are multiple universes, and there's so many universes that we, we call this a multiverse, and that each of these universes have different characteristics, so obviously we're in the, in the universe that has the right conditions for intelligent life to evolve. And then the third possibility is an intelligent designer, an intelligent creator who designed the universe specifically to support complexity and emergence of intelligence. But if we want to look at those explanations, uh, if the universe can exist only in one uniquely constrained or predefined way, that still does not explain that it's there in the first place. And it's the same with the multiverse. A theory of everything leads to scientific determinism, a strong denial of, of free will. I could do a debate on this if I look at the literature. It's absolutely staggering that prominent physicists who are atheists are basically advocating determinism. What they really say is that they're robots, but they don't want to draw that conclusion. The key thing is that the openness of the universe and the free will of human beings are key propositions in Christian theism. On evolution, there's a book by Paul Davis, who is a physicist and has written several books on philosophy of science, and he says, the answer to the question whether the emergence of life from non-life could follow predictably and inevitably from the laws of physics alone under a wide range of initial conditions is a decisive no. The laws of physics are simple mathematical relationships expressible with very little information and they not, cannot contain the high information content of living organisms. To understand the high information content of life, we must recognize that it is a product, not the laws of physics alone, but of the laws of physics and the history of the environment. And then back to Francis Collins, and he is stating, God is not limited in space and time, created the universe and established natural laws that govern it. Seeking to populate this otherwise sterile universe with living creatures, God chose the elegant mechanism of evolution to create microbes, plants, and animals of all sorts. Most remarkably, God intentionally chose the same mechanism to give rise to special creatures who to have the intelligence and knowledge of right and wrong, free will, and a desire to seek fellowship with him. To end this, I would say, we as human beings are not asked to believe in fairies or in flying spaghetti monsters, but we are asked to believe in the creator of the universe, the Christian God who stands at the beginning and the end of all time. And by believing in God, we become truly human, not fulfilling any longer our own desires, but aligning our desires and aspirations with those of God and letting him work in our lives. Thank you. And speaking third in opposition, and indeed closing the debate as a whole, is Daniel McRae. Daniel is a, is a technologist with a passion for philosophy and education. He is head of publisher services for, Al, for AI ad tech startup Adaptomy and holds an MA in philosophy from UCD. He's also founder of www.myshortcourse.com, a free resources website for Irish teachers and students of philosophy. Instead of addressing uh, kind of head on this idea about belief in religion, I'm going to talk about it in a slightly uh, off kilter way. Um, it would be ridiculous to argue against belief, right? I, I, I think that it would be absurd to try and argue against belief. I myself believe a lot of stuff. I'm not in the habit of arguing against myself, except by way of preparation. So I believe there's a room outside that door. I believe my wife loves me. Uh, I believe that apples are delicious. Um, uh, so I believe a lot of things. So before I believe something, um, there's some certain conditions about what it constitutes to believe in a claim. So what I'd like to do now is go through some of the questions that I would ask if somebody wants me to believe something. Um, and I think it's also fair to say uh, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And there is no more extraordinary claim than the claim that God exists. It's the big one. 
So, uh, first of all, first thing I'll ask is if somebody wants me to believe something, qui bono, which is journalism 101, anybody have a bit of Latin? Not the panel. Right? Who benefits? Who benefits from me believing in this thing? Is there an explicit or implicit benefit to somebody in me believing this thing? In the case of religious belief, um, two very clear examples, uh, the Vatican, German, and Australian Catholic churches have a combined wealth of $60 billion. Belief is big business. So that is an ulterior motive uh, for me to believe in this thing. Um, it might be a bit gauche to call it all a big Ponzi scheme, um, but I don't know that I'm above that. Uh, secondly, um, to claim that there is a superhuman entity outside of the universe that is absolutely infallible, that only you have a direct line to, is an extraordinary claim. It makes you amazingly powerful and influential. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. So when somebody makes me want to, or asks me to believe something, I always think, who's going to benefit from this? And those are two things that make me uneasy about religious belief. Um, another question I might ask is, how is this belief being put to me? So, uh, is it uh, being put to me based on the arguments, or is this some sort of coercion? You are literally threatened with an eternity of hell for not believing this. That's a very high consequence. I find that often the best ideas don't acquire that level of coercion and threat. Um, we'll move on a little bit around uh, extraordinary claims. So. This I always have a problem with. Um, God is infinitely mysterious uh, and almost completely unknowable, and yet we know with phenomenal specificity his views on sex. Um, that seems bizarre to me. He's simultaneously outrageously mysterious, but we know exactly what he thinks we should all be doing behind closed doors. Um, what evidence can we muster to put this together? Uh, we have miracles. Everybody's got miracles. How are we supposed to separate truth claims when every different religion makes claims to miracles? Religious books coming out of your ears. So lots of different religions have lots of different beliefs. They can't all be true. There's no legitimate epistemological way to separate them other than to say, well, I've got a gun. I think my side is going to win. There's no way to separate and distinguish these claims, which again makes me think this idea of belief a uh, suspect. Um, so, look, somebody asked me to believe something. Next question I'll probably ask is, is it internally consistent? Does it make sense just in and of itself? Um, some quotes. Um, With God, all things are possible, Matthew 19, 26. A few books later, the Lord was with Judah, and he drave, that's correct, drave out the inhabitants of the mountain. But he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. What an extraordinary passage that is. So on the one hand, we have a God who is totally omnipotent, and yet chariots of iron can't drive them, or even drave them out of the valley. So these beliefs that we're being presented with are themselves internally uh, inconsistent. Um, and you can go two ways with this, right? You can either say, look, the Bible is literally true, and that's your belief, in which case you have to reconcile all these strange little idiosyncrasies and contradictions, or you can say, my belief is the Bible is not actually literally true, it's just a good book. And on that basis, we probably have a useful conversation. Um, does believing uh, in this thing that I'm being asked to believe, is it dangerous? Is it a dangerous thing to believe? We've already had quite a few arguments about the dangers uh, of belief. I won't uh, hammer that point uh, home too far, um, but certainly uh, the victims of religious belief are in their millions. Uh, the figure estimated for the AIDS epidemic, due in large part, but of course not exclusively, uh, to the immoral purpose of condoms, 75 million. And this is the thing that drives me nuts about dogmatic beliefs. Um, no right-minded atheist, and we've got some pretty full-on atheists here this evening, no right-minded atheist will believe that Christians deliberately wanted to kill 75 million African people with AIDS. 
That would be an absurd belief. No matter how nuts you are as an atheist, nobody would believe that that was the intention. But this is the problem with dogmatic beliefs. They paint you into corners where you have to come up with increasingly ridiculous responses to justify the positions you already held. It's extraordinarily hard to get yourself out of these corners once you've painted yourself in. If you say condoms are immoral, it doesn't matter how many bodies stack up, you can't reverse that position. The Pope tried in 2010. The Vatican issued a missive very quickly afterwards said, and uh, listen, that wasn't official dogma. That was just, he wasn't saying condoms are okay. He's, uh, uh, he might be mistaken. He, he hasn't had his nap when he made that claim. Um, uh, and that's what's so frustrating. It's right-minded people who desperately want to help with horrible consequences because they're dogmatically based to these beliefs. And um, right, uh, the believer, right. So let's say belief isn't about truth claims. Belief is about other stuff. Makes you happier, makes you live longer, gives you a sense of community. Um, I think it's really intellectually bankrupt to believe something because it makes you happy. Surely we want to work towards something because it's true. Um, uh, also, living life longer. Uh, I don't know how many of you have had first hand interactions with adult diapers in your later years, but living longer is not something I'm actually looking forward to. In very quick conclusion, because I know I'm running out of time. Um, to be a non-believer is to know that it falls to us to make the world a better place. There is no supernatural father figure who's going to rescue it or guarantee the punishment of the wicked. Um, to the believers, I would conclude simply by asking that you apply all of the skepticism, the uh, criticism, the uh, clear thinking that leads you to believe that Zeus and Odin and all of these other mythological creatures are not real. All I'm asking is that you go one step further because we need you. We need your intelligence, we need your passion. We don't need you making these arguments. Thank you very much. The motion that this house would rather believe in a God. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. aye. And all opposed, say aye. 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 Okay, the motion has been defeated. Thank you very much.